Hello dear friends of human spaceflight. A lot has happened again the last few days. For one, SpaceX has filed a really interesting proposal to the FCC, one in which we learn how surprisingly early they intend to launch Starlink satellites on the Starship Super Heavy rocket. We were quite surprised about the date and you will be too. Then SpaceX keeps testing the Starship launch tower at Starbase Texas and to simulate the weight of the rockets that the Mechazilla arms will have to bear, SpaceX engineers have devised some nice tricks. Then over at NASA, the agency's own aerospace safety advisory panel said that NASA must clearly define its future role in human spaceflight and put forth a clear vision for the next 20 years. So how might this vision look? And lastly, NASA gave an update on their work on the Artemis 2 mission and we promise even not to be too sarcastic about that one. A lot to talk about, so stay tuned. So in a filing submitted to the FCC, SpaceX has basically revealed that they want to go all in Starship regarding Starlink satellite launches. That means that instead of continuing to launch Starlink with Falcon 9, they want to switch to Starship in order to launch the Gen 2 versions of Starlink. And not only that, but the date when this should happen is quite baffling, namely March this year. But wait, wasn't March the earliest possible month in which Starlink would be permitted to launch on its first orbital test flight? As it currently stands, the FAA will be finished with their assessment on February 28th and quite likely will approve Starship and Super Heavy launches from Starbase Texas. But we aren't talking many launches anyways, as it looks in the current draft version, it will be 5 Starship launches annually from Boca Chica at first. Later then, this might be expanded. But still, it is quite astounding to find now that SpaceX is planning to already launch the first second generation Starlink satellites, not on Falcon 9 anymore, but after March directly on Starship. So this means that, should the first orbital flight of Starship and Super Heavy be successful in March, then the second ever launch of Starship and Super Heavy some days or weeks later, depending of course on how well the first test launch went, will already bring lots of Starlink satellites to orbit. While currently the Falcon 9 can only launch a maximum of around 60 satellites per launch, Starship will be able to launch around 400 satellites per launch, almost 7 times as many. And of course, with the Mechazilla catching mechanism, the turnaround rate for Starship will be unprecedentedly high, so that launching the whole Starlink constellation, all 42,000 satellites of which only around 2,000 have been deployed, will be possible in a relatively fast manner. Imagine how long it would have taken to launch all these satellites with Falcon 9. Over 600 Falcon 9 launches. But with Starship, it will be only around 100 launches to fully deploy the Mega Constellation. By that, SpaceX will achieve twofold in one go. Zwei fliegen mit einer Klappe schlagen, as a German would say, but I will not say it in English because every time I say it wrong. So basically, firstly, SpaceX will thus be able to extensively test Starship. By launching 100 times, SpaceX can really gather a lot of data with Starship and Super Heavy and thus minimize any risk for future human flights. Every slightest error, every slightest mistake or technical difficulty will be monitored and corrected, so that the safety level for the first human flights will already be extremely high. Thus, Starship Starlink launches serve as test flights in order to increase the safety of Starship and at the same time, SpaceX will deploy Starlink and make huge revenue. Only recently we have received another update that Starlink now has already over 100,000 active customers worldwide. Only one year earlier, it has been only 10,000, so it tenfolded in one year. And that's just the beginning. This would be such a cash cow for SpaceX, it's incredible. And please subscribe to this channel if you like your dose of space news with an additional dose of political incorrectness, humor and sarcasm. Thanks a lot in advance.
and a key system for Starship and Super Heavy launches are of course the Mechazilla chopstick arms that will catch the Starships and Super Heavies in mid-air in order to allow for an insanely efficient and rapid reusability. In order to simulate the load of Starship and Super Heavy boosters, SpaceX tested the weight bearing capacity using an old trick, as you can see here, namely they filled up some ginormous sacks with water and tested the rotation of the arms and the vertical displacement. It all seemed to work fine. That is another important milestone towards achieving the big picture, which is sending Starships to the Moon and Mars in order to finally achieve what NASA wasn't able to achieve namely to make us a multi-world species. Talking of NASA, their Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, short ASAP, said on January 11th that the agency is at an inflection point in its management of human spaceflight programs because it relies more and more on commercial hardware. ASAP worries that NASA is not thinking strategically about the transformation that lies ahead regarding the ever-increasing role of the commercial spaceflight sector. And let's be realistic here, the ever-increasing role of SpaceX. The panel said, quote, considering its ambitious goals and constrained budget for NASA and hence the United States to continue to play a strategic leadership role in space, the agency must transform. While private industry efforts are an ever more important factor in the US government's future endeavors, the commercial sector alone has not and will not be the vehicle that drives national goals. Consequently, the agency will need to operate differently, from strategic planning and how it approaches program management to workforce development, facility maintenance, acquisition strategies, contract types and partnerships. The panel believes that NASA's vision for the future and a clear definition of how it will evaluate and make decisions related to risk, in addition to how it will manage and execute programs, are extremely important factors in ensuring human spaceflight safety. As a result, the primary focus of this report is the urgent need for NASA to strategically define its future role and articulate a vision and a set of guiding principles to direct its efforts. Interesting. Sounds like someone is a bit afraid that certain commercial spaceflight companies are getting a bit too powerful and that NASA's leadership role is getting diminished in the process. In order to counter that, ASAP is suggesting the following three-point plan. NASA is to first develop a strategic vision for the future of space exploration and operations for at least the next 20 years driven by how it will understand and manage risk in the more complex environment. Second, establish a board of directors including the center directors and other key officials that focuses on benefits to the agency as a whole rather than individual parts. And three, manage Artemis, NASA's effort to return humans to the moon and conduct sustainable operations thereafter as an integrated program. It is especially interesting what ASAP had to say about Boeing on this matter, regarding the stock valves on the second unmanned Boeing Starliner launch attempt in August 2021, where 13 propulsion valves would not open and thus the launch had to be scrubbed. ASAP said, Quote, equally disturbing was that the program got very close to launching the spacecraft before the stock valve issue was identified. This is exactly the type of situation that the panel urges NASA to aggressively avoid as the agency proceeds with assigning Artemis contracts." End quote. Well, so risk management needs to be unified between NASA and the commercial contractors, in this case Boeing. While NASA saw the risk of valve failure prior to launch as being moderate, Boeing saw it as low. Now we can all quickly understand why Boeing would see this risk as low, don't we? Anyways, it's good that ASAP is recommending these steps, but it will of course be very interesting to see how NASA will react to SpaceX's ever more growing power and monopoly for heavy lift launches to the Moon and to Mars. Basically, SpaceX will be able to launch hundreds, nay thousands of times more cargo and later also people to the Moon and Mars. Now that will be really interesting to see how NASA will adapt its strategy and long-term planning to such a crazy disruption. Because they are all still living in the past, at least officially, which was again confirmed by a status update regarding their last own rocket, the SLS and the first manned mission to the moon in 50 years with Artemis 2. In this update, NASA let us know that they are not only busy working on getting Artemis 1 off the ground, 
the uncrewed test flight, but nay, they are also working on Artemis 2, 3 and even 4 already. For example, we can read in the update that, quote, Aerojet Rocketdyne, the RS-25 lead contractor, is readying the RS-25 engines for the next three SLS flights after Artemis 1. The engines have been tested and will be integrated with their respective core stages closer to final assembly. The engines for Artemis 2 are ready to go to NASA's Michoud assembly facility in New Orleans, where they will be integrated with the SLS core stage. The Artemis 3 engines are being prepared for flight at Aerojet Rocketdyne's facility at NASA's Stennis Space Center near Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and the company is already manufacturing engines for missions beyond Artemis 4." Ok, so that is certainly interesting. Hardware is already being built for missions beyond Artemis 4. Another piece of rocket hardware for Artemis 2 already arrived at the Space Coast on July 28, namely the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage ICPS. It is undergoing final preparations at the United Launch Alliance facilities and will soon be delivered to the nearby Kennedy Space Center. The ICPS fires its RL-10 engine provided by Aerojet Rocketdyne to send the Orion spacecraft towards the moon. ULA is already building the Artemis 3 ICPS in its factory in Decatur, Alabama. So it is certainly interesting to see that Aerojet Rocketdyne, Boeing and Lockheed are already building hardware for missions way beyond Artemis 2. But let's first get Artemis 1 off the ground before we can celebrate. With all these delays, it's absolutely unsure when Artemis 2 will get off the ground. Currently it's being scheduled for 2024 and Artemis 3 not before 2025, but more likely 2026 as we know NASA. But here also, it will be highly interesting to see which impact SpaceX's Starship will have on the SLS contractors. I promise not to be sarcastic about SLS this time, it was brutal and required an inhumane amount of willpower, but I'm happy I managed to do it. Thank you dear viewers for watching this video, the whole team at To The Future wishes you all the best and on to the future.